is Greg Trowain with Offshore Engineer TV, and we're very pleased to be joined today by Jessica Brewer, Wood McKenzie, to discuss her recent article on Offshore Engineer on how to decarbonize the upstream industry. Jessica, to start, decarbonization is all around us, no matter which industry you choose, including, ironically, offshore oil and gas. Can you put in perspective the pressure upstream companies are under today to start the energy transition? Yeah, sure, Greg. Um, I mean, I think there are quite a few different angles to this, um, but I think one of the key considerations is like perception. Um, you know, upstream companies are under a lot of pressure from a wide range of um, stakeholders. So you've got governments, investors, financial markets, society, local communities, putting pressure uh, for there to be change. So I think you know, companies are going to, they need to define their strategies to, to future proof their business in order for them to retain that, that kind of social license to operate. And I think, you know, that need for companies to just reaffirm that they are good operators uh, is only going to continue to, to grow in importance as, as time goes on. Uh, so let's look at some early movers. Who are they and what measures specifically are the most common being taken today to take those initial first steps towards decarbonization? Yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting because there's quite a wide range of, of companies and now company types that are actively actioning decarbonization strategies. It's definitely decarbonization, I'd say, has grown in momentum over the last couple of years. So you've got everything from the majors, national oil companies, independents, private companies, all looking at, at decarbonization and, and putting into practice different uh, initiatives. Um, there's obviously a, a variety of different solutions with different scales. I mean, if we start at what you could potentially consider the kind of low hanging fruit, that's kind of looking at operational efficiencies, you know, um, maintenance planning, reduced flaring, leakage mitigation, those types of things. Um, those are kind of quite widespread, I'd say, and, and you could argue part of many companies now best practice. You then get to the kind of larger scale big ticket items that are more complex and um, they can potentially be a lot more asset specific so you're looking at things like low carbon power you know when you look at it about 70 percent of upstream scope one and scope two emissions come from power requirements so you can see why companies are looking at low carbon power you know we've seen electrification be quite widespread now in, in, in Norway you've got kind of the larger scale uh, gas capture projects where gas that was previously flared is being captured and put to use a lot of examples of those types of projects in the likes of the, the Middle East. Um, and then probably slightly more in its infancy, but you're starting to see carbon capture and storage uh, a little bit more uh, in terms of looking uh, upstream companies looking to maybe reduce venting uh, by applying uh, CCS technology. So those are just some of the examples, but probably some of the ones that are kind of more um, mainstream at the moment. Um, you know, I know we're still relatively early uh, in this decarbonization chat, but can you put in perspective how these decarbonization efforts will tangibly impact a company's bottom line? Yeah, I mean, it's quite interesting and it, it is, is dependent on a number of factors. You know, firstly, you know, each solution has a differing scale and complexity, but if we look first at those kind of initial examples I gave, the kind of operational efficiencies, that low hanging fruit, in many cases, those initiatives can actually be value accretive um, in terms of, you know, you're maybe um, saving gas molecules that previously would have been lost, um, you know, either through flaring or, you know, other usage. Um, and, and that gas uh, is now available for sale. So that's kind of adding to your, to your revenue stream. Now, obviously, the larger scale projects often require quite large upfront capital spend. Uh, and that can be detrimental, you know, to the overall project economics. But again, it's dependent on a number of factors. You know, you can still have that saving from that gas that was previously potentially used for fuel or the large scale flaring. You know, in terms of electrification, you can often see greater uptime and, and lower maintenance requirements. So you're getting uh, more time out of your equipment. Um, you know, the fiscal terms being applied for some of these projects, and also it, it can often offset um, carbon taxes in the jurisdictions where they're applied. So, you know, it, it can also have a positive impact on value. And, you know, in that carbon tax example, you know, the, the carbon and NOx taxes applied in Norway are probably, you know, have been one of the things that have helped incentivize Norway's move to its electrification and, and decarbonization down that route. You've already touched on a few, but what do you see as the leading consequences for companies and organizations that do not 
move to reduce their carbon footprint? Quite uh, simply, what are the tangible hazards that they could face? Yeah, I, I think with this one, I'd probably flip it on its head a little bit and maybe kind of look at more the strategic advantages for those companies that are moving ahead with, with decarbonization and looking to kind of have cleaner upstream um, operations because there are quite quite a few. I mean, if you look at it in terms of the market, it can create um, a competitive market advantage. You know, we've seen the rise of green LNG. We've seen the first carbon neutral cargoes. Um, you know, in, in the longer term, will there be an advantage to having a cleaner molecule? So that, that's one thing to look at in terms of the market. Um, obviously, you know, you're wanting to future proof yourself against tighter regulation or policy or, you know, the introduction potentially or increase in carbon taxes. So that's that's another advantage. And, and then you kind of also looking at that retaining access to, to the to the capital markets. And then finally, kind of looking at, you know, increasing value of your portfolio, whether that's through existing, uh, you know, assets or, um, you know, acquisitions, um, you know, or reuse of existing equipment for different uses, you know, that that's another area that um, could be looked at. So I think, you know, a, a lot of companies know the direction of travel, you know, that direction of travel has been set. Uh, and, you know, and they don't want to be left behind. So I think, you know, looking at it from in terms of the advantages is what a lot of the, the, the companies will be will be doing. OK, well, Jessica, we truly appreciate your content or your contribution to the magazine. And I truly appreciate your time today. Have a great day. Thank you.